going to be hearing four presentations from our panel which reflect the diverse range of approaches they are taking to engaging young people in dance. And those young people are at different stages in their journeys. For some, dance is a life-enhancing experience, whilst others are taking it further and aspire towards a career. And after we've heard from all our, of our panel, we'll take some questions. So can I ask, if you have a question from one of the earlier presentations, that you hold it for the end, because I hope we will have time to actually talk a little bit further in a, in a bit more detail about what we've heard. Um, I know some of the sessions have been quite full, so I think we'll be able to go on for an hour. Um, I'd like to introduce our first panel member, Hannah Robertshaw. Hannah is Youth and Community Dance Director at Yorkshire Dance. Thank you. Um, so I've got an absolute privilege here because I'm presenting a, a project which, um, w which took place in Yorkshire, in Leeds, back in March. Um, it's called Dancing with Your Neighbours. Um, it was an interesting project to come about because um, Yorkshire Dance were running um, the Juncture Festival, which is an international festival um, of professional work, and it was curated by Wendy Houston. And I, my challenge was how we could link the work that we do with children and young people to this, um, to this festival of professional work. Um, and we run a youth company at Yorkshire Dance, and they're a youth company of young people from very specific postcodes in Leeds. Um, and those postcodes, um, those postcode areas are quite deprived parts of the city in East Leeds. So it was how do I connect this group of young people who we do very grassroots youth dance with to this very um, professional level festival of international work. So I flicked through the programme, it's the first thing I did, and I thought, what's relevant? What would, what would float their boat? What would be the thing? And I came across this piece of work by Louise Wallinger, and it was called Annoying the Neighbours. And I looked at this, and, it, and I read about it, and it said it was a piece of verbatim theatre, and it was Louise had gone in and spoken with neighbours about neighbourhood conflict and um, things to do with, you know, uh, neighbours' um, boundary issues and noise issues between houses, and she collected all these very rich stories which she put into a piece of theatre. And I thought, that's my, that's my thing. This is going to connect with these young people. So we went back to the young people and we started talking about their neighbourhoods, where they were from, um, who the characters were, who the people were, did they talk to their neighbours, did they not talk to their neighbours, why, you know, what were the streets like, what did it feel like to live there? And then from that, we had a really short run into this project, just three weeks um, to work with them on, on some little nuggets of ideas. And those of you that work with young people know that those, that wasn't three whole weeks, that was, that was three two hour long sessions, so six hours to think about this idea. And then um, we took them onto the streets for a day and a half and we filmed them. And the idea was that they would communicate with their neighbors about dance, when their neighbors danced, why they danced, why they don't dance, um, and just start this kind of dialogue with their neighbors. And ideally that that dialogue would happen through movement and not just through words. So you're going to see the film that we created. Um, I'm not going to talk about it um, anymore until after you've watched it. So uh, please enjoy it, Dancing With Your Neighbours. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I just want to share some of my observations about that project, really. Um, so the first thing I would say is that the practical dance that you saw, the movement that was created, was arguably the weakest aspect of the film um, and actually the more interesting content was the neighbours and was the stories and the characters and seeing how they related to the young people and um, we never storyboarded this film out we didn't have much time to film so um, I think a lot, a lot of the content that, and a lot of the things that we experienced over, those, over that day and a half filming in Seacroft is not in that film. And there was um, a lot of colourful language that we encountered on the streets, people wondering what the we were doing there. And was that dance? I don't know. So it just made me think about how we rarely tread this path and that we often take dance into the community and we say that we're doing community dance but more often than not it's about the community still coming to a central place so still coming to a, a, a school or a church hall or a community center albeit within that community but it's about people wanting to be there and leaving their houses or being encouraged into that space so I just thought this was starting to touch on something interesting about community dance 
in terms of actually going into people's lives, you know, going into their houses, what happens when you put it on their doorstep? And to me, that starts to kind of touch on the nuggets of real audience development, real grassroots audience development. And the, the interesting thing for me was also how some of these neighbours, and in fact, I think all of the neighbours in the film came to Yorkshire Dance to the Juncture Festival to watch their film. Um, and then that was really an interesting thing for us to open our building to these people who live on our, on our doorstep where, where our building is, but don't engage with the building. But they would come because they're in the art. They were central to the art. So that was an interesting thing for me. Um, the connection and understanding that the young people felt to each other after this project was something that came out. They had a workshop with Louise Wallinger after they did this film. And it was actually the first time they'd sat and watched their film and they sat with Louise and watched it and with me. Um, and that was an interesting observation as well because the young people had no concept of what they were in and what they'd been doing until they sat and watched the film afterwards and then they went, oh! I get it now, I see, I've made something. But up until that point, because we weren't rehearsing for a piece on a stage, it was beyond the realms of their experience to that point. So that was really, that was really interesting. And they started talking about uh, how they'd found the process. So this leads me on to discuss some of the challenges with you. So this is not an easy way to work. It doesn't engage huge numbers of people, although it does have the potential to do that digitally if we create a product, a film. Um, our presence on the streets of Seacroft in Leeds was really questioned by local people. Um, they couldn't understand why we were there and what we were doing. So again, if this was part of a longer piece of work, I'd really like to look at that engagement and how we could develop some of those connections we've made with the boys playing football or some of the characters that we encountered, how we could kind of um, involve them more. So we worked with an artist in the, in the studio for the three weeks leading up to this project that doesn't usually make this sort of work. He makes very um, uh, movement-driven aesthetic work, which is beautiful. Um, but that was a very interesting challenge as well, working with an artist who perhaps wouldn't usually work in this way. So again, another interesting um, challenge. And also making anything sighted and not making it in the site, but working in a studio with young people and then taking, and taking it and putting it in the site, again, that's another, another challenge and something if we had longer uh, with the group, and maybe if it was a different time of year, I don't know if you clock that, but it was pretty cold when we were doing it. Maybe that's something we could do more as well, actually work with them in those locations. Um, so the other challenge I... I, I hit upon was that the young people didn't fully understand, I think, what they were involved in until they saw it. And it's quite an intrusive way to work. So we'd ask them to approach their neighbours and talk to their neighbours and see if we could come in with a, with a, with a film, a very small film crew. But actually, it's really intrusive and you have to be very trusting to let, um, to let us come in, to let us in the front door. So the young people were quite reluctant to approach people that they didn't already know. Um, so again, that would be an interesting thing. How could we actually connect with people that, that we don't know? Um, and I think the other thing that the, the group thought about with Louise Wallinger was this idea of um, people being far willing, far less willing to share good stories, positive stories. So we were asking them about dance, which is a nice nice thing. It's a nice thing to talk about when you danced and your first dance. And, but they were less willing to share, whereas Louise Wallinger had said to the young people, everybody wanted to talk to me. Everybody. Because it was complaining about something. It was sharing something negative. It was having a moan. So she built up a wealth of material, whereas we felt like we, we didn't get as much Maybe. So that's just, and they, the young, it was interesting hearing the young people reflect on that and say, well, the media is just full of bad news, isn't it? It's full of the bad stuff. When do we celebrate the good stuff? So that was just, that was just quite an interesting reflection for them. So in terms of the successes of this project, I think it's opened up potentially new ways in which we could work with communities. It feels like the seed of an idea, which could now be expanded. 
Um, it gives us an insight into the community and offers up a very personal viewpoint from the individuals who took part. So the idea of sort of hidden voices is something that I'm really interested in exploring. And I think the young people, a lot of the young people we work with, they feel like their voices are hidden. So how can we, how can we help them draw that out? And maybe using spoken word, film, something that isn't about just creating a, a polished piece of youth dance for the stage. Maybe there's something about the process um, of that that we can help to draw out some of their individual stories and personalities and look at who they really are as young people and what they have to say. Um, and then the final, the final success to share with you is that we talk to the young people afterwards about, um, you know, how's this been for you? Now you've seen the film, how do you feel? What, what have you learned? And one of them just said to the other one, not to me, said, I just feel I know you better now. And I thought, yeah, that's the success for me. They, they have a better understanding of each other in that group just by going into their neighbourhoods and sharing, this is my house, this is my grand's house, this is where I rode my bike for the first time, this is where I hang out when I'm not in this hour and a half dance session with you once a week. Because those young people that are coming to our building, often that's the only time they will see each other. So this was a way to open up their lives and who they were to their peers. I'm not gonna say any more because these guys have all got good things to say and we're really short for time, but thank you very much. It's a really interesting project and a, a, an example of a really original approach and it's fascinating to hear what you, um, what you gained, what the young people gained and the responses from the neighbours, so thank you for that. Let's move on to our next presentation. I'd like to introduce Anna Kenrick, Artistic Director, and Carolyn Lappin, Executive Director from Y Dance in Scotland. Good af morning, afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, uh, on the cusp. Um, I'm going to say hardly anything and then we're going to show our film. Um, just for those who don't know us, uh, we're Why Dance, we're the national dance organisation for children and young people in Scotland, uh, established in 1988. Uh, we work across three main areas of work, we participation, formal education and talent which enables us to offer young people in Scotland many um, in access points into uh, different projects and then a pathway of progression for young people in Scotland, uh, not to 21. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to Carolyn who's going to introduce the actual project that we've been asked to speak about. Okay. Um, Why Dance has been working in partnership with the Scottish Government um, through the Health Department, NHS Health Scotland and currently with Sports Scotland to address issues connected to the physical activity strategy. Um, a particular focus of Scotland's physical activity strategy is teenage girls, because as we all know there's a lot of evidence that teenage girls drop out of sport in schools, don't want to take part in PE and that kind of thing, um, and looking at dance as a way of addressing that. Um, so we've been working a, since 2005 on three separate projects, and our current project is uh, Why Dance Active which began in uh, 2012. Um, we're just completing our first three-year cycle, hoping that it will, funding will be renewed next year. Um, it's part of the Active Girls programme, which is uh, administered by Sports Scotland. Uh, and we work alongside two other projects, which are run by the Youth Sport Trust in Scotland and Youth Scotland, which is out of school hours, uh, youth clubs and that kind of thing. We employ a staff of six on the project full time and they are out delivering all year round all across Scotland. The project has been offered to all 32 local authorities in the country um, through the Active Schools Network, which is also run by Sports Scotland. There's an Active Schools Coordinator uh, in the schools, there's an Active Schools Manager for each a local authority area um, and their remit is to encourage young people to get active out with school hours um, and to develop local partnerships so that that can continue. Um, so our focus is very much on, um, on leadership. We go into an area and we offer a day dance workshops to get girls, teenage girls interested in the project. Um, we then offer a dance leadership course over the course of a week, usually in school holiday time. Uh, and the idea is that we're training young dance leaders who can then go on and, and spread the word and work with other young people in their area uh, and be dance champions. 
We also run a workforce development programme which uh, helps us to develop teachers so that they can create more dance opportunities where the young leaders can then feed in because obviously the you know people with a sports leaders award in dance are not qualified to lead a dance class they need to have that adult input to, to allow them to, to work with their peers um, we back all that up with an online hub of uh, video resources and lesson plans um, which is changing all the time and updating all the time so that there's always somewhere else that they can go um, to a to develop the work themselves um, so statistics, you can read, um, statistics are fairly boring, um, but we are getting a really broad reach across Scotland, we've hit almost all of the local authorities, there's always one or two that are not that interested, um, and there's a lot of evidence now starting to come back to us that the, the, um, the, it's working locally, that there are new groups starting up lunchtime clubs in schools, older girls working with younger girls, that kind of thing. Um, so if we could just play the video, is that possible? It's interesting because so much work with young people is up to 25, 24 or 25, and you comes up at 21, so mm -hmm. I was interested to know why it was up to mm -hmm. it, It's kind of a historic thing. Um, originally, when Scottish Youth Dance was set up, um, the funding stream came through the Education Department of Scotland, and they were looking at primary, secondary, tertiary, so that was really where it was set. To be honest, we fudge it out a little bit, you know, but it's, it's, the company's been going now for um, what, 27 years. <laughs> um, so that's really where it came from originally. So. Thank you, Anna and Carolyn. It's clearly a, a, a high quality programme that you're running um, and it's got a, such a broad reach. It's really impressive to see the work that you're doing. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to move on to the next presentation and I'd like to introduce Polly Risbridger, Director of East London Dance, and Sherilyn Albert, who is a young person who's part of the field project with East London Dance. Before I start, I wanted to really kind of take a moment to reflect on some of the things that have kind of come to the surface over, over the last three days. And I think particularly picking up on Pauline's uh, uh, speech this morning, and I think share with you some of the examples that we, we're developing at East London Dance to really respond to that sort of changing environment around us. Um, we've heard again about lots of different outreach access going into the grassroots, and the case study that we're going to be really talking about is these progression routes and enabling young people to take the lead to find their artistic voices and to progress into whatever sort of field they choose. Um, but before I get into that, I want to introduce you to Sherilyn Albert. Um, Sherilyn started dancing with us at the age of nine and is now 18 and has just started her first year at university. Sherilyn's one of those incredible dancers who just seizes every opportunity going. She is the most open-minded, really ambitious young dancer. And I just wanted to invite her here today, really to share her perspective on, on all the different things that she's taken part with um, at East London Dance. Thank you. <laughs> um, I have a great appreciation for all the opportunities East London Dance has given me in the past. Each one not only being greatly responsible for my growth and improvement as an artist, but also allowing me to create my own opportunities from the projects I've done and the people that I've met. Right from the beginning of my journey, I attended consistent classes with high quality teaching that gave me the foundation to be part of their youth company and benefit from professional level training. For me, it's the breadth of opportunities I would have never imagined one place could give me that I'm thankful for. I've performed across a dozen London stages and big platforms such as the Royal Opera House and Buckingham Palace. I've been able to showcase my own choreography at Blueprint, help curate and be a part of the field, and work with renowned choreographers such as Wayne McGregor and Hofesh. The field in particular, helping to create the project, meant I was part of the selection panel for the programme leader. It was my first interview experience from that perspective. I'm very used to engaging in projects at the stage where everything is already set in place. Having the opportunity to see the steps beforehand and be active and present in the decision making brought about new thoughts such as what I as a participant would require from a facilitator, how organisations engage with young people such as myself and it also highlighted the importance of scheduling and gave me an insight into how much work goes into de delivering projects like these. I also got the opportunity to work with Hofesh Sketcher Dance Company. After taking part in a week-long movement intensive, I was invited to teach young people on their summer school program. I was able to 
pass on knowledge I had just acquired based on Hofisch's technique of totality. The trust in me to do so instilled confidence in me and proved a sense of equal exchange between us participants and the company dancers. I owe a lot of the confidence and artistry I've acquired to East London Dance and the people and the opportunities they've exposed me to. Often people talk of giving young people a voice. In these instances, I was not only given a voice, but a place. Not just to think about my capabilities, but to develop, practice and deliver them. Okay. <laughs> How do you top that? So I think I just want to take us back to our context to start with and really just give you a little insight into East London, first of all. 200 languages spoken, 71% of the school pupils have English as a second language, three of the most deprived boroughs in the country, and 25% of the population is under 18, alongside really high unemployment rates. But this is changing, particularly post-2012 and the Olympic Games. The population of Stratford is going to be doubling over the next 10 years. Boris Johnson's vision for Olympicopolis is going to, to open a new cultural and education hub on the Olympic Park uh, in 2020, with major new cultural institutions arriving just over the road from us. £12.5 billion of private investment is pouring into the area, but at the same time, the public services are being slashed. Housing prices are rising, the changing demographic, professional sharers are taking over the family homes. Uh, we have inter international transport connections and the, inter the historic kind of industrial spaces are now being knocked down and replaced with these kind of glass, uh, face, glass sort of faceless, uh, shiny new buildings. So it's pretty easy for young people to feel quite excluded from that change, to feel isolated and kind of hard to find their place within that. But what is really exciting about East London is that, that context has bred this incredible underground dance scene. Um, you just have to walk through uh, the old Stratford shopping centre, not the, the nice new glossy Westfield over the road, to find dancers that have taken over that public space every evening, training, honing their craft, inviting in you know, these incredible b-boys from, from around the world to come and train with them in that public space. That space is one of the only indoor spaces in East London where they don't get moved on by security. They own it. They, they're, they're empowered to be there. Um, so years of kind of underinvestment, lack of opportunities has, has formed this very strong and tight-knit dance community in East London, and young people are very much at the centre of that. Um, one artist describes the approach to, to doing what he does as, as the hustle. It's about going out there, doing what you can, getting what you can, making it work to, to, for the passion of your art. So this energy, ambition, entrepreneurialism, innovation is what makes East London one of the most exciting places to work in dance. And as Sherilyn described, we at East London Dance really do work from the ground up. We want to listen to those young people's ideas and the artists and the communities that we're really working and serving. I, over the years, I've had an amazing pleasure to hear young people coming and getting meetings, pitching ideas, presenting all the ambitions that they have, launching their new dance companies, uh, putting on events, making films, but so often having the doors closed on them and not being able to find the money or the time or the space to really kind of make those events and ideas happen. So we found ourselves really at East London Dance feeling quite frustrated that we weren't able to respond to all of those ambitions. We didn't have the money that we could just sort of hand over, but we also wanted to, to not just hand money over, but support young people to go and find new ways of accessing that. So we set about designing the field, um, which is our future innovators program for 16 to 25 year olds. And the field's mission is really to give young people the skills, knowledge, contacts, and the resource to make their ideas happen to make them employable and to help them develop really sustainable portfolio careers that might involve performance but might involve producing or teaching. Um, so Sharon described her role in that. She was one of two ambassadors that we invited in at the very start of that journey. Um, she, she came onto the selection panel alongside me and Emma Kerr from East London Dance and together we chose Kate Scanlon as our facilitator to come in and lead that programme. 
Um, Sherilyn worked with us to design the flyers, the look of it, how do we communicate about this, this thing, and then look at actually what the content is. And it's that, it's that young person's voice at the heart of the decision-making process, at the heart of the planning, that has made really where we are now two years later, the programme such a successful model. So what is the field? Um, it's, it's evolving. We're in year two of a three-year sort of funded programme. Um, and do talk to Emma, who's sat here in the front row, who really leads and, and engages uh, on that programme much more than I do. Um, so the programme, we head down to Bournemouth to start off. So we go and join Derek and Pavilion Doubt Southwest, uh, getting out of London, getting out of our context, having some space, having some time away, and getting to know each other. We then have monthly seminars which are looking at fundraising, marketing, ideas generation, event management, event producing, really looking at what the skills you need to make your ideas happen are. We then, give, we, we then give the group a weekly dance studio slot, which they have to design a programme for, for other young people, and then they go about marketing and delivering that. We do masterclasses and intensives in teaching, uh, technical work, filmmaking, all sorts of different sort of intensives, um, and also give them a chance to work on our other programmes. And finally, we get into the Dragon Den style pitching, um, in which we genuinely invest in their ideas, and then they have to go and raise more money on the back of that investment, and then work together as a group to produce and, and, and deliver those events and ideas. So already, we've invested and seen a contemporary dance battle event, um, an under-18s choreography showcase, a dance film exploring new approach to telling stories through dance, a digital Hall of Mirrors um, installation, which enables you to dance with your morphed reflection, dance film festival, celebration of the roots of New York house and dance, uh, sorry, house dance and music. Um, and as, as this sort of, after those two years, as people are graduating from the programme, we're then inviting them back in, so they're now co-delivering those sessions alongside the other specialists we're inviting. They're mentoring the new participants. They've even been on the selection panel for the new cohort that are about to start. Um, and they're also getting employed with us, but also with lots of our partners across the dance world. Um, we're picking up the successful ideas and events into our own program, not as our youth dance program, but just as an artistic event in its own right that has a wide appeal for a wide audience that goes beyond their sort of friends and family. This keeps our programming fresh at East London Dance and makes sure that what we're offering uh, for our audiences on our doorstep is relevant and accessible and champions the work of those young creatives. But putting young people in the artistic driving seat, of course, means that we also need to support their creative practice um, as well as their producing skills. We really want to kind of push the aesthetic, we want to push the experience, inspire them to think in new ways, challenge assumptions, and really enable them to find their own unique artistic voices. So at the start of the field, we did a big consultation session, uh, post-it notes all over the wall um, about who do you want to work with, who inspires you, who do you want to learn from. So we had uh, Barack Obama and Richard Brunson, but also what we had was Hofer Schechter um, as a choreographer sort of written across this wall. So really wanting to respond to that consultation process, we then started a conversation with the company about coming in and doing a workshop. Um, and at that time, it just felt right for both organizations. And we've evolved this quite major three-year partnership, which places young people at the center of that work. And we're now on our way to a half a million pound production that's going to be taking place in 2016. Um, and I wanted to pick up over the course of the last two days, there's been lots of talk about the mainstream versus the fringe or the underground. Um, and I think at East London Dance, we've long, long been the champion for the fringe, for the underground, um, and really giving space and, and a platform for people that aren't getting recognition elsewhere. Um, but what we've also done over the years is develop a series of relationships with what you might consider the, the mainstream, Royal Opera House, um, Sadler's Wells, to make sure that young people that we're working with have access to that cultural mainstream, as well as the underground scene that we're sort of supporting. Um, but it's not about turning the underground mainstream. 
It's really about a dialogue of exchange. It's about influencing access to excellence, but it's also about revealing the excellence of the underground that's evolving in East London. But also it's about redistributing investment and getting the money come and, come and spent in East London with those young people that we're working with. So we were clear at the start of this kind of three-year partnership with Hofesh, so I'm running over, um, that we, uh, we didn't really need him as a choreographer to come and teach our young people how to dance like him. Uh, what we did want to do was embed a process of creative exchange um, where his dancers, him as a choreographer, can come and work with the dancers that we're nurturing and create that dialogue, value all the aesthetics that are, are being sort of innovated within East London and allow that to, to kind, kind of uh, merge and form a new aesthetic for this, for this new production. Um, so over the next two years, we're building a really quite large crea young creative team to work alongside Hofesh and his company uh, to devise to create and to lead other young people in this major new work, where we're going to be taking over an industrial warehouse in summer 2016, thousands of audience going to be part of Lyft, and really will be that platform to reveal the talented young artists like Sherilyn. So bringing us to a close, what does all this mean, I guess, both for young people and for us? I think those that are pursuing a career in dance, as we heard from Pauline and Linda this morning, are entering into a very different world to, to where we may, may have emerged into. Um, and I think it's our responsibility as a sector and as organisations supporting young people to carry on our own innovation process to make sure that we understand that changing environment, to really to think about new ways, new models, and share that experience, but also listen to the experiences that young people are having. And they're already doing it. They're already finding you know, the hustle, <laughs> the way to make their ideas work. So I think we need to absorb some of that and really sort of start challenging ourselves as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Polly and Sherilyn, for that inspiring presentation. I'd now like to introduce Luke Pell, independent consultant. Thank for our last you. presentation. Great. Can I have the clicky thing, please? That's a technical term. Um, I'm going to sit here so that we can save time, if that's all right. Um, hello, my name's Luke Pell. Um, I'm an independent artist based in Scotland. Um, so sometimes I make work, and sometimes I curate work, and sometimes I work with other artists and organisations. Um, I think my job is to, to respond and to connect to the voices of many people. So I don't represent one organization. I try and join up between the spaces between. Um, I talk about being an advocate for alterity, so other ways of being in performance. And so a lot of my work is around dance and disability, or has been around dance and disability. Um, and so the foundation asked me to talk about work with young disabled people and progression routes. There's a huge amount of work in this country, there's a huge amount of work in Wales, in England, in Scotland, there's work in Ireland. Um, so it's kind of impossible to represent all of that work in 10 minutes. <laughs> Everybody else has one case study. So what I've tried to do is to draw these, uh, draw together three ways of working which I think are interesting opportunities um, for thinking about how we move forward. What I was going to do, if you saw my original blurb for today, I was going to give a bit of an impassioned plea. Um, about the time is now, we need to act now. And this is kind of my response to the fact that we're facing the, the potential removal of the independent living fund um, and access to work. So which, these are core support systems in terms of the English government system that enable the, the autonomy of disabled people to live and to work with equality. Um, but I've just come back from Brazil, which is also why I'm a little bit sketchy. Um, and whilst I was there, I was really reminded how we uh, Brits have a tendency to kind of colonialise things and kind of go, you should do it this way. Um, when one size doesn't fit all, and also the cultural context, the politics, the legal frameworks, the education system is very different in other places. And given this is an international conference, I thought I'll not go down one road. I'll offer you several, several models which... They're based, I want to emphasize, they are based on what we have here. So they might not translate elsewhere, but perhaps they are offerings which can be starting points for working and, and disabled young people progressing in, in other cultural contexts. So, 
my love of grey hasn't worked out on that screen. So the three, the three areas, the three constellations are support, bespoke, and inclusion. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about was dance support specialists in training and education settings. The next thing that I'll talk about is bespoke programs for individual development. And then the next strand that I'll talk about is inclusion in existing programs for young people. So the first constellation of thinking for me, um, what I should also say is that when I was putting this together, I realized that each of the constellations that I'm going to talk about took place over about three years. They're cycles of activity that happen, by, they're the group, groupings of people coming together whether that's artists and organizations. So this kind of domino effect thing. Um, but I've looked at sort of joining up of, of projects which happened in three-year periods. Um, and I think, I know Lucy's going to come to this later, I think one of the major problems that we suffer from is this kind of projectization of work. Everything's a project. And then when a project finishes, we lose the momentum that's been, that been, that's been built up. But talking specifically about dance support specialists in training and education settings, um, Kanduko Dance Company ran what was uh, the Kanduko Foundation course. Um, that program ran for about three years. It came out at about the same time as the Disability Discrimination Act, which is now called the Equalities Act of England in 2010. But this came out in about 2004 um, as a response to trying to prepare students to come into dance and drama award schools. Grey Eye Theatre Company also ran a project called The Missing Link, and it was funded by Dada. And it was to try and give people specialist training to, to get into uh, conservatoire or to get into HEI that they hadn't had previously. But a key role in that was the dance support specialist. And these were trained dance artists, um, particularly on this program, they trained at the place on an inclusive practice module led by Charlotte Derbyshire. They developed an interest in this and had gone on to become dance support specialists. So they had a dance knowledge themselves, but they also worked closely with those students around their own progression. They worked one-to-one -one with them in classes. This model then went on to be used um, at Coventry University, who have been, have been prolific in developing work with disabled students and having disabled students progress through their programs. But they took the model of the dance support specialist, and there's a document which you can't see it very clearly here. I can circulate my PowerPoint to people. But that I think people forget exists. It's downloadable. It's on the internet, um, created by Coventry University, called Moving Matters. And it, uh, it outlines the various ways that they worked with students. So one of the things I said in my blurb is, this is evidence. There's loads of, I've been doing some mapping recently for a consortium called the National Inclusive Dance Network. And what I discovered, and kind of already knew, is there's tons and tons of mapping that is already done, that's already out there. We know this stuff needs to be updated, but we have a tendency, I think, um, in dance to map. And then they sit in the ether. And then what do we, how do we turn this into action? Um, so I just wanted to remind people that this Moving Matters document exists. It's a really comprehensive um, document. And there's also a CD-ROM CD available that you can order from Coventry University that explains how they worked with students in higher education. What followed on when they closed down the Kanduko Foundation course, so funding was redistributed from the dance um, and drama award schools back into dance and drama award schools to address access, was um, Kanduko worked in partnership with the Erdang Academy, which is a, a, a performing arts, a more commercial entity. A lot of their students go onto the X Factor or onto um, West End musicals. But they created a program called ADAPT, which is accessing dance and performance training. And again, the dance support specialists became key to working in those settings. So that's one example of ways that people have worked to progress young people in, in training and education settings as the dance support specialist. And if you're interested in that model, I'd suggest order the Moving Matters um, handbook. So the next uh, model that I wanted to talk about is one which is currently developing um, at home in Scotland. Um, again, I'm kind of drawing together work that I'm aware of. So there are a number of um, artists and organizations who are supporting inclusive, inclusive practice. We have some of the leading disabled artists in the UK based in Scotland. And so following on from the work of people like Janice Parker, uh, Independence, Caroline Bowditch's uh, role as the dance agent for change, Water Baby Dance, Dirty Feet, which is a company with them, and Why Dance with Make Music Move, Move and Blast. There's been talent 
of various kinds emerging. We've, 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 we've acknowledged that there are talented young disabled people, and talent means very different things. It might not just mean one, one aesthetic. Um, so over the past two years, Water Baby Dance have been managing a, a project called Talent Hub. Um, w the first year, we kind of audited where each of those individual skills and interests were at, and we brought them together as a community of young emerging disabled artists who are interested in developing their practice. This year, we've had further funding from Creative Scotland, and we're actually working on bespoke development plans. So there are two artists each. We mentor one individual artist each, so we share the responsibility for these young people. And these are young people who are all, who are all wanting to pursue very different kind of dance pathways. Some people want to teach in the Royal Conservatoire. Some people want to develop their Pilates and their anatomical awareness. Some people want to choreograph duets on Ballet boys, right? Um, they're, they're, these are very different things, but we're, so we're working in what we're working in a way which is bespoke to where people are at in terms of their schooling, their capacity as young disabled people, where they live, their family needs, the support that's available to them. But we're also thinking very realistically about what's about their expectation, about not building false expectation. There's this, we've talked to, I've heard a lot over the past year about this tendency around professionalization. We want everybody to be professionals. That might not be realistic or possible for everybody. So with this bespoke program, we're really trying to be accountable for actually what's realistic for these young people. And then the thing that that might move on to is there's just a new initiative which is launched in Scotland called Flip Artists, which is about disabled artists working with some of our bigger cultural institutions. Um, to get those artists into those institutions and to affect change by having those artists around. So that's bespoke programmes for individual development. And the last strand that I wanted to talk about, which many of you will be familiar with already, um, is inclusion in existing programmes for young people. So Dance4 and Trinity Laban um, did some research on behalf of the CATS, the Centres for Advanced Training. So this is another document which is in existence, which can be downloaded from Dance Force website. Um, and that's a piece of a document called Changing Perceptions. So they looked at how the Centre for Advanced Training could become accessible. And it was an early piece of pilot research, very rigorously undertaken by Imogen Walker, supported by Veronica and Emma Redding, and Dance Force relationships, particularly with Oakwood School. So again, there's a robust piece of research which has been done, which is in existence, that people can use to think about um, what it would be to include young people in existing programs that have a very particular nature. Out of that, Dance will have a long relationship with Oakwood School, which is a special educational needs school in Nottingham. And so this year, that school took part in the U Dance um, platform. There's a brilliant film that's been made by the Foundation for Community Dance, Youth Dance England, and Dance 4 that showcases that. This is also sitting in the ether as an example of work that people can access. Um, but it showed how, how easy it is to include. There is work that needs to be done, but actually we can include disabled people within mainstream programs. Um, around the same time over the past few years, the National Inclusive Dance Network and the Foundation for Community Dance or People Dancing's Alliance for Deaf and Disabled People have been looking at how we affect change across the UK and specifically in England. Um, Linda and her colleagues came down to a National Inclusive Dance Network meeting to, to undertake consultation about the next U Dance platform and what would be useful to get more disabled people. Um, so basically, Linda came to the people, that network of people who know, who are working on the ground with disabled people because she knew those people were out there. So it's, it's some of these things I kind of feel like we put barriers in place when actually we have the knowledge out there. Um, so U Dance 2015 in Plymouth because also Plymouth is a hot spot for inclusive practice with people like Adam Benjamin, Sue Smith, Purpose Built Spaces, Claire Summers, that you know, they have a good track record there, is, is the perfect forum for a, a year of U-Dance which actually focuses on inclusive practice. But I know that from talking to Linda and from others, the intention is that this will set the benchmark for us to just carry on in this way. Um, so I, I present all of these because I don't think that one size fits all. We know this. We all have different ways of being in the world. That's why it's brilliant. And so I don't think any one of these solutions can work for everybody, but there are numerous ways in which we can address the progression of disabled young people. And there's really robust evidence out there already. Um, so talk to the people that are doing the work and, and access these existing documents. But um, my, my mantra now is support bespoke inclusion. Thank you. Thank you.
I think we may have time for a, just a couple of questions towards the end. I know some of our panel need to move off um, quite shortly, but there are, there's time for a couple of questions. Does that, would anyone like to ask a question of any of our panel? Judy Hughes, I work with Wales Dance Consortium. Um, you talked about um, the Scotland project. You talked about um, the Dance Leaders course, about um, girls who want to be not just professional dancers. Um, and um, increasing confidence, developing their skills. Sorry, I'm looking back at my notes. Um, and um, I just wondered, how does that all work financially? For instance, if you attend a class and then decide to be a dance leader, what's your individual financial commitment? No. Well, none really. Um, the girls that we're talking about are, are usually working within their school setting then. Um, and they'll be supported by the active schools coordinators. Um, so the, there's no, they're not dance leaders in the sense that you know, they're going out delivering classes that people pay for or anything like that. It's just a peer-to-peer -peer education to, to get more people active in the school. Um, so, so they don't they, have to pay for any of their training? No, no. no um, Sport Scotland funds, well, the, the money actually comes from the government, um, from the, the physical activity strategy budget. Um, and we get it through Sport Scotland, so it's all good. <laughs> I hope you're able to sustain it. Thank so do we. <laughs> the money runs till next March, and that so far. <laughs> Question down the front here. Thank you. Uh, Oval Parkin, and I work for Dance Up uh, in Avent. Um, well, it's also for the um, uh, Y Dance uh, project, and I was wondering about. Um, well, this, you touched on that, the sustainability of, of, of the project, and I was wondering if you are able to follow, um, well, the numbers of classes the young people are carrying on leading, and is, is that you've got a high success rate on that, because I imagine that the momentum is very high at the beginning for people to keep leading classes, but is that sustained? Yeah. <laughs> Um, we, because uh, the whole programme is run through active schools department, uh, we go, th that's our inroad into the local authority. Um, it, oh, um, I, I might, no. Do you want to speak? <laughs> okay, <mic>. sorry. Um, <laughs> I have to guess what Anna was going to say now. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's we monitor the yeah. The, the, we are required to, to monitor that, you know, ourselves at the beginning. But then the active schools take that over. And active schools is another program which is funded from the government through Sports Scotland. So they're having to justify that as well. Mm -hmm. And it is one of the one of the things that they continue to measure after we've um, delivered in an area. Um, we would if we get the funding renewed, we would then be revisiting all of the areas that we've already been into. So hopefully, you know, the next cohort will be coming up because the girls move on and leave school and at that point, you know, it, yeah. it, it disappears. So we need to make sure we're getting the next generation as well. So. Time for one more and then we need to draw to a close. And if we don't, then that's absolutely fine. We can head off yeah, to lunch. Got to OK, <laughs> they've got a train to catch here. So can I um, just close us here? Thank you for... Um, to the panel for presenting. Um, it's been fantastic to hear about your work. Thank you to you for coming.